This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The Electoral Commission in the DRC meets ahead of results announcement. Madagascar's Andre Rajoelina calls for unity after court confirms his victory. And authorities in Somalia welcome increased U.S. air attacks on militant group Al-Shabaab. Hello and welcome to Africa Live, only on CGTN. I'm Karen Roberts, live in Nairobi. Rama Nayang joins me now with all your business headlines. Thank you very much, Karen. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. The World Bank is warning of an economic slowdown around the world, fueled by trade uncertainties in 2019. And Uganda's foreign debt levels have scaled up to alarming levels. We'll have the numbers in the course of the hour. Now, though, let's start the latest in current affairs with Karen. Thank you, Rama. We begin in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Electoral Commission is meeting ahead of an announcement of results from the presidential election. The meeting, which could last for two or three days, is to deliberate and to evaluate the presidential results. Riot police have been deployed in front of the Commission headquarters in the capital, Kinshasa, and along the city's main boulevard. The Central African nation held its historic polls on December the 30th. Since then, there have have been accusations of fraud and reports that the government is negotiating a power-sharing deal with one opposition candidate. If the Electoral Commission announces the true results of the ballot boxes, it will become. But if not, I do not know what will happen. About these rumors between Felix and Kabila, we want peace and calm. If Felix is one, then they need to prepare to hand over power in a civilized way. We don't want people to die when they announce the election results, blood to be spilled, because we are fed up, we're tired, and we're waiting for a peaceful announcement which will allow us to rejoice rather than cry because we are fed up. Meanwhile, an observer mission says it witnessed 52 major irregularities in the 101 vote counting centers that it observed, including people tampering with results. There are 179 counting centers currently tallying the vote across Congo. Simocell witnessed 52 cases of irregularities we judge to be major. Four cases of witnesses being refused the signing of the tally, two in Senkuru, one in Kasai, one in South Kivu. There were 20 cases of falsifying results on the tally in Manyema and in Senkuru. In 16% of the vote counting centers where the hand counted tallies were not taken into account in the compilation of the results, mainly in Manyema. I think the least we can do is to denounce the irregularities, because as an observer mission, what we have said is what we observed, based on what was posted from the tallies that the observers had access to. At the same time, we're going to respect the law which forbids us from and which only authorizes the election commission to publish the results of the votes and results. Well, Chris Ochaminga joins us on the line from Kinshasa in the DRC. Uh, Chris, any indication yet as to what time the results will be announced? Yes, Karen, I've been reliably informed that the Electoral Commission will make that announcement at 10 p.m. That is midnight in Nairobi. Um, they normally uh, uh, make such announcements so late here because they don't want people to protest, and, and, and it's, it's going to be the second time that it has happened. They normally make such announcements very late when everyone is sleeping to ensure that there's peace and calm in the city. And uh, Chris, there's talk of a coalition between the government and the opposition. Any details on this? Yes, I was uh, informed by one of the uh, members of uh, the UDPS party, that is of uh, Felix Tshisekedi, the oldest political party in the DRC, that they, uh, Felix Tshisekedi has been holding talks with the government about the transition, and um, and then people of his party, his supporters, have been celebrating outside the headquarters, 
celebrating drinking or playing music, they believe that their candidate is the winner and is going to be declared, declared very uh, tonight. And so that, that, that talk about uh, the, the, the meeting with the president is, is indeed true. And uh, as people are await the results, which, as you say, they're not going to be released until midnight, how would you describe the general mood in the country? Well, the mood is one of uh, disappointment for supporters of one of the leading candidates, that's Martin Fayulu. They believe that their, their, their candidate was going to win this election. They're very disappointed about the turn of events, and they're saying that... Um, not worth voting the DRC because it looks like uh, the results are always manipulated by the powers that be. But of course, uh, the other party, the other side, uh, Phoenix Piketty, his uh, supporters are very happy about what's happening. They they believe that their man is going to be declared the winner today. And there's also a lot of fear in the city. Shops have been locked, have been have been closing about two three hours before the usual time. They they, they normally close. Because uh, they, they, there's been rumors that there's going to be there's going to be violence around the city, so many people have closed their shops, gone home early. Some haven't even come the past two days because they're fearing that there's going to be an outbreak of chaos. And that's that's really the whole game. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, Chris Ochamringa there joining us on the line from Kinshasa in the DRC. Well, for some analysis on the DRC, earlier we spoke to Richard Moncrief. He is the Central Africa Director at the International Crisis Group. I think, we're, I think we are firmly in the domain of a disputed result already. Now, what does a deal mean? The problem with a, a, a deal is what's its relationship to the electoral result? Because whoever is excluded from the deal is just going to go, wait a minute, this isn't about deals, this is about how people voted. So how do you make a deal? And certainly some deals are going to need to be made, but make sure that whatever deal you make respects the will of the people that's been expressed through the ballot box and has been expressed, you know, fairly peacefully and so forth in the ballot box. So the talk of deal is worrying because it's going to start to make the Congolese and indeed international actors think, Actually, when they say deal, they mean subvert the vote. To Gabon now, where Prime Minister Emmanuel Isosa Ngonde has visited the national radio and television station that was taken over in the failed coup on Monday. A small group of soldiers called for a popular uprising while the country's ailing president was abroad. But the government took control of the situation within hours. Two soldiers were killed and others were arrested by the military. Security forces have been deployed in the capital Libreville and will remain there over the coming days to maintain order. Those arrested have been handed to the prosecutor of the Republic, who will open a judicial investigation from the information that he will receive. Well, we are going to a short break now to go away. Lots more to come, including... Madagascar's Andre Rajolina calls for unity after court confirms his victory. And Malta allows a migrant ship that's been stranded at sea to dock on its coast. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. We come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. My home country lies at the foot of Africa the southernmost tip of our beautiful continent and the unique point at which two great oceans meet. Now on a clear day in Cape Town, you can just make out Robben Island, the place where Nelson Mandela was jailed for so long. South Africa has changed so much in the years since then. 
but it is this country's history that shaped me and took me into reporting. I'm inspired by Africa's men and women of courage. It's the everyday hero who brings out my passion. The creatives, the decision makers, the risk takers who are shaping a bright African future. I see them in Cape Town. I see them in the pulsating city of Johannesburg. I see them across the continent and I know our time has come. CGTN is a platform where African voices can speak for themselves and take their stories to the world. My name is Lindim Tongana and I'm news anchor and reporter for CGTN. The new president of Madagascar, Andre Rajolina, has appealed for unity after Monday's High Court ruling confirmed his victory. Rajolina also thanked his runoff opponent, Mark Ravlo Manana, for reaching out to congratulate him. The court ruling followed Ravlo Manana's rejection of the December the 19th election results and claims of voter fraud. <laughs> Both candidates in Madagascar's presidential runoff had said they would accept the outcome of the polls. But after the December 19th runoff, Ravalo Manana complained of widespread fraud. He asked the court to nullify the results. On Tuesday, though, the Constitutional Court ratified the results given by the Electoral Board, saying Rajalina won 55.66% of the votes versus 44.34% of the vote for Mark Ravalo Manana. I want to congratulate on behalf of the whole court, the new president of the Republic who was elected, Adri Nrina Rajuelina. Rajuelina was quick with his response. The High Constitutional Court studied every report from all over the island and they were able to study every detail of the electoral process and the victory was clear. The announcement triggered celebrations among supporters gathered in the capital, Antananarivo. We hope he will accomplish everything he had promised during the campaigns. We hope all these promises will be kept. I am very happy because the person that I voted for won. I am very hopeful. Both Rajalina and Ravalamanana spent lavishly on campaigning with promises and handouts distributed liberally to voters. The bitter rivals, both former presidents who were banned from running in the 2013 election, faced off once again. I can't help but thank my opponent, Mr. Mark Ravalomanana, who congratulated me at the High Constitutional Court Palace. Rajalina will be inaugurated as president on January 25th. The African Union says it respects the ruling by Madagascar's High Constitutional Court that declared Andre Narina Rajolina the president. CGTN's Coletta Wanjoi now reports from Addis Ababa. The African Union Commission Chairperson Musa Faki Muhammad says the victory of President Rajolina Andre Narina in the polls was on the basis of a promising program which garnered widespread support. He says the Malagasy people have demonstrated to Africa and the world beyond their responsibility and political maturity, as well as their deep commitment to peace, stability and democracy. The African Union is asking all political actors to accept the results and refrain from resorting to violence. Former President Mark Ravolomanana had disputed the runoff results, claiming there were malpractices on elections day and also vote counting. The AU says respect for the results of the elections will preserve the democratic gains and results achieved by Madagascar. Koleto Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. China has congratulated Andre Rajolina on his election as president of Madagascar. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Liu Kang says China is willing to join hands with the new government of Madagascar in promoting cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative and implementing the achievements from the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit in Beijing. Liu says this will advance bilateral relations to a new high. Now to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and its leaders first. Overseas diplomatic visit of 2019 is grabbing global attention. This is Kim Jong-un's fourth visit to China. It came at the invitation of Chinese President Xi Jinping. He was accompanied by his wife, Ri Sol-ju, and a delegation of high-ranking DPRK officials, including 
Kim Jong Choi, a key nuclear negotiator with the United States. They traveled by train across the border to China. A spokesperson for President Moon Jae-in said South Korea hopes this trip will contribute to peace on the peninsula and be a stepping stone to a second DPRK U.S. summit. Well, earlier we talked to our reporter Jack Barton in Seoul for more. The government finally uh, putting into place a response. First came from the office of President Moon Jae-in welcoming the trip, but then we got a more detailed press conference by a spokesperson from the foreign ministry who said that these high-level exchanges, but particularly the face-to-face -face meeting between Chairman Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping, uh, would push forward the agenda of denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, but also hopefully to bring about that lasting peace. and. He also said that South Korea would foster what he called a virtuous cycle of this diplomacy, bringing in regional partners such as China. But really the way it's being perceived here in terms of a breakthrough is that it is restarting or revving up that engine of diplomacy that's been sitting in the car park idling ever since that last summit between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. Uh, really it's gone nowhere since then in terms of denuclearization progress. So this visit is seen here, particularly since it's the longest visit that Kim Jong-un has made to China so far, is really seen as a serious attempt to revive that diplomacy. And that's why here there is a very high expectation that when the trip wraps up on Thursday or soon afterwards, at least within a week or so, uh, the expectation, real or not, is we're going to hear an announcement from Washington on when and where that likely second summit between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump will take place. Malta will allow two ships that have been stranded at sea for weeks with migrants on board to dock. Prime Minister Joseph Muscat says that they will then be redistributed among eight European Union countries. Dozens of migrants, including five children, had remained stranded at sea with no European country offering a safe port. A total of 49 people have been rescued by two vessels run by German humanitarian groups. The vessels have been sailing back and forth off the coast of Malta for days. The ship's crews had expressed concern about the migrants' mental state, aggravated by bad weather and seasickness. The only sustainable outcome is a Europe-wide um, solution, where all the member states um, are involved in the solution and we stop with this kind of ping-ponging from one uh, marine rescue coordination centre to another, each saying, oh, it's not my problem, no, this is, it's Italy's problem, no, it's not my, it's not Italy's problem, it's Malta's problem. Um, everyone is trying to get rid of their responsibility and that's absolutely deplorable but at the same time I understand the position of these countries because they're trying to get rid of the responsibility because not everyone is taking responsibility and that is a huge failing for Europe, a massive failing for Europe. No sleeping in the night because of the wave. We are, we are dying slowly in this place. We are dying slowly in this place because it's what we didn't expect. We are not okay. We really need the, the European help right now. The UN, we really need their help. Well, for more on that story, we are now joined by CG10's Kevin Osberg, who is in Brussels for us. Uh, Kevin, what led to the change of heart by Malta after many days back and forth? Well, because the Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, essentially put down an ultimatum here. He said those two ships will not be allowed to dock in Malta unless other EU countries help take in some of those migrants, those 49 migrants on board those two ships, as well as about 250 migrants that Malta also recently rescued from the Mediterranean. So about 300 migrants, it said, had to be spread across various EU partners, neighbors, and friends. And in the end, that's what was negotiated. 
through the help of the European Commission. Uh, about, uh, about 250 migrants will be going to uh, various EU countries. Some of them will also be sent home. There's a group of about 40 Bangladesh migrants uh, that Malta has rescued that have already been deemed that they are not uh, refugees. They don't meet refugee status. So instead, they're going to be sent back home. But it took a lot of phone calls here uh, in Brussels from the European Commission, uh, specifically the commissioner in charge of migration, Dimitri Avramopoulos, for weeks now has been working the phone to try to get the various uh, EU countries to agree to take in. Today, when it was announced uh, that Malta would allow those two ships to dock, he was very relieved that this crisis was over. But he said these past few uh, weeks have not been the best for Europe. And uh, Kevin, is the frustration over this latest group of migrants likely to deter the movement of people, would you say? Well, when you look at the numbers, they're already slowing down. The numbers just are uh, continuing to de decrease when it comes to the number of migrants and refugees fleeing to Europe. At the height of the refugee crisis in 2015, more than a million fled to this continent. Uh, but we now have numbers for 2017. The EU says just about 150,000 illegal crossings into the EU were made. Now, we first saw during the height of the crisis, uh, the frontline country in the EU was Greece because people were leaving Syria, heading into Turkey, and then making the dangerous journey into Greece. But because of an EU deal with Turkey, that essentially cut down that migration route. Then we saw numbers really explode when it comes to the number of migrants making their way to Italy. Italy now has a populist government that has deterred a lot of uh, migrants from coming there. So now we see the main frontline country is Spain. So uh, as EU policies toughen up, as member state policies toughen up, uh, the number of migrants continue to decrease uh, and we continue to see that in the data. Okay, uh, CGTN's Kevin Osbeck there. Thank you very much for that update. Moving on to other news now. Australian police have launched investigations into an incident where suspicious packages were sent to multiple embassies and consulates in Melbourne. According to reports, the British, American, Croatian, New Zealand and Swiss consulates in Melbourne and in Canberra have received strange packages. Authorities said that they are trying to learn more about them and the possible motive of the sender. The alerts come after a similar security scare at Sydney's Argentinian consulate on Monday. A white substance contained in clear plastic bags with an envelope was found. Police did not identify any of the embassies or consulates involved. However, the Australian newspaper reported that missions affected included the United Kingdom, New Zealand, India, Croatia and Egypt. Now to Ethiopia and people in the northern border town of Shishaya have reportedly prevented the Ethiopian army from leaving the area near to the neighboring uh, country of Eritrea. The incident is the second of its kind in that part of the country with people claiming the withdrawal of the defense forces is ill-timed. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed called the incident illegal. CT10's Giram Chala has more. After peace prevailed between Ethiopia and Eritrea, the two nations are decreasing heavy military presence at their borders. And the work of returning heavy military artillery is being done by Ethiopia at the moment. But on Tuesday afternoon, hundreds of mostly young men have prevented the hundreds of military vehicles from leaving the area known as Shire, a town bordering Eritrea. Reporters suggest the people blocked roads and asked the military to return to the border, claiming that the area is not fully secured yet and the decision of withdrawing the troops was made without proper preparation and study. This is the second time in recent weeks that the Ethiopian army was interrupted by locals in that area. After the incident, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has said, and I quote, the federal government has an absolute power to move the army from one area of the country to another. What happened is both inappropriate and illegal. The Ethiopian Defense Force Deputy Chief of Staff, Brown Ujula, also said the act is unacceptable and was organized by a few people who are trying to distract the process of withdrawal. Brown said, and I quote, the military will not take measures for now and will attempt to peacefully resolve the problem. The Ethiopian Defense Forces vehicles and their numbers loaded with artilleries and machine guns are said to have been parked inside Shire Stadium 
until authorities find solutions to end the ongoing standoff. Group Dara CGTN at the suburb, Ethiopia. On to Somalia now, and authorities there have welcomed an increased air campaign to weaken militant group Al Shabaab that's claimed thousands of lives. CGTN's Abdulaziz Billo reports now from Mogadishu on the effect of U.S. drones on the country's war against terror. Monday strike in Baghdad, a rural village south of Mogadishu, is the third air assault carried out by U.S. military since the beginning of 2019. The strikes have neutralized at least 20 militants, according to AFRICOM, the United States Africa Command. Washington says the strikes have helped degrade al-Qaeda's most powerful ally in the African continent. Most strikes are carried out to support government forces and African Union troops as they clear militants from rural areas that have acted as a launching pad for the militant group. Drone strikes uh, uh, hurting Al-Shabaab and you could see the signs where they uh, uh, have to hide all the time. It affects their uh, daily uh, operational uh, activities but if these drone strikes are not part of a, a comprehensive strategy then that would some, that would be only something that Shabaab can always recover. So I think I would welcome the drone strikes, but they have to be part and parcel of a, of a grander strategy. Airstrikes have gone up since Donald Trump took office in 2017, from 15 in 2016 to 46 last year. And the trend is likely to continue this year as Mogadishu hopes to weaken the terrorist group. A deadly attack on a United Nations compound last week near the country's international airport injured at least three UN staff members, prompting the global body to reduce its footprint here in Mogadishu. The UN chief has since called for an immediate investigation after Al Shabaab claimed responsibility for a barrage of motors that landed at the UN offices. Experts say securing Mogadishu must be a key priority for the government in 2019. You cannot keep this city safe while the organization, whether it's Shabab or Daesh, are uh, holding grounds in the country where they can uh, uh, organize and uh, deploy uh, their attacks to uh, different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. This is a war that everybody has to uh, take part. I think this is what uh, all the successive governments and this current government have been failing to uh, rally around that campaign. At least 538 people have been killed in these airstrikes since the beginning of 2017, far more than the previous 10 years when the militant group Al Shabaab controlled large swaths of the country. Abdul Aziz Bilal, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Despite a muted response from their members not to report for work, teachers in Zimbabwe are vowing to continue with a strike, citing incapacitation. They claim the rising inflation of the country's economy has eroded their income, making it unaffordable for them to go to work. CG10's Farai Makatuya spoke to some of the teachers and filed this report. Bright-eyed pupils begin a new school year filled with hope and anticipation but not the case for their teachers who are battling to cope with an ongoing currency crisis. While most reported for duty for fear of disciplinary action, one teacher I spoke to simply couldn't. I don't know the repercussions, but I want to go to school, but I am incapacitated. That's because her salary has been eroded by the rising cost of living. School fees. I need school fees for my children. They won't be allowed to study in school without me paying their fees. My landlord wants rent in US dollars, and I have nowhere to get US dollars. I earn 310 a month. Maybe you can help me budget it, because I have failed to find a way of budgeting it. A meeting held Monday to try to address the challenges hit a stumbling block after government said it can't accommodate the teachers' paid demands. It is unfortunate when government responds by saying that they have no capacity to raise the U.S. dollars because according to them, technically they are giving an explanation that uh, 300 million is what is needed a month to offset the employment costs in this country. 
and 300 million coincidentally it is what is being raised through exports so they are saying that situation is not tenable it is not possible but for us that demand remains because that is the best way going forward. That sets the scene for a standoff that could adversely affect the education sector because even if teachers show up for work, their level of performance may not be where it ought to be. For those that we have reported to work, they are not there. They are there physically, but mentally they are not there. A state of mind that could remain until their needs have been fully addressed. Farai Mokutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Well, let's now go to Rama. He's got all the latest business news for us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. Here's what's coming up in business. The World Bank is warning of an economic slowdown fueled by trade uncertainties in 2019. And Uganda's public debt has risen to alarming levels. We'll look at the numbers and why people are concerned. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. Business in Africa is high risk. After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move. And it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Ucheo Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. Right then, let's start the segment with a look at the World Bank's latest forecast for 2019. In a fresh report, the bank says it expects global growth to continue to slow down as trade and investment moderate in part due to trade tensions. World Bank lowered its estimate for global growth in 2019 to 2.9% from its previous forecast of 3%. The World Bank noted that trade tensions would remain elevated as financing conditions tighten. The World Bank said that large emerging markets and developing economies have been hit hard and still face troubles. Their growth was expected to stall at 4.2% this year. That's with a weaker than expected rebound in commodity exporters and deacceleration in imports. The World Bank report also said that East Asia and the Asia-Pacific would still lead global growth this year. It said that China would maintain growth of over 6%. The report's tone was particularly negative for the world's number one economy. The World Bank said the U.S.'s GDP would grow to 2.5% in 2019, that was down from a 2.9% estimate last year. The report said that growth could even slow to just 1.7% in 2020 as the Trump tax cuts wear off. The World Bank also listed four topical issues that global lenders should deal with, including declining inflation in emerging markets and large swings in world food prices. Xiaocheng, CGTN. Kenya's leading telecommunications firm Safaricom has rolled out an overdraft facility through its mobile money platform M-Pesa. Now, users of this facility can now send money or pay for goods and services, even when they have insufficient balances in their accounts. The overdraft facility is named Feliza, and it will be available to 24.2 million M-Pesa clients at the moment. It also comes at a time when M-Pesa and data services help to kick up half-year net earnings for the company by 20.22% to $309 million. With Feliza, M-Pesa users can get overdrafts as high as $490, depending on the value of their transactions. The Telco's overdraft facility is in it will attract a daily charge of 0.5% rather of the amount borrowed. Still in East Africa, Uganda's finance minister has defended the government's borrowing habits and he insists that even at over $11 billion, the country's debt is 
in his words, sustainable. This comes in the wake of a report by the country's Auditor General that indicates that public debt was up 22% between June 2017 and June last year. Much of the country's debt is linked to ongoing infrastructure projects in transportation and energy. Here's CGTN's Michael Baleke with the details. A new road project takes shape in the capital Kampala. The paved road will rid locals of dusty trucks but the cost is becoming unsustainable, according to the Auditor General. There is worry that Uganda does not have the capacity to generate adequate revenue to pay back the loans now amounting to over $11 billion. Our service delivery, the quality will have to go down. And then also the other issue could be that much of the, 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 the private sector will have to be crowded out. And yet we know that private sector indeed uh, brings in investment, employment and growth. Uganda owes China more than $400 million and close to $800 million in loans to the World Bank. A big chunk of this money is going towards the development of hydropower dams, roads and the oil and gas sector. Uganda plans to borrow more money for the oil pipeline, refinery and the standard gauge railway. Uganda has continuously borrowed. Our biggest challenge is the trend. It is on an increasing basis. But the government insists the country is not in debt distress and that it is way below the International Monetary Fund's risky threshold of 50%. We therefore compare very favorably with the peer countries because most of our debt has been contracted on concessional terms. Please take care of these concession terms. Longer period of repayment, very small interest rate. By the time the loan becomes due for servicing, we're already reaping. But the Auditor General's report shows that about 50% of the loans may expire by 2020. And this means that increasingly, a bigger portion of the government's tax revenue collection will go to debt repayment. However, government says the economy is expanding fast enough to settle its dues. So when it is expanding, it means more production. More production means more revenue. It means more exports. More exports means more dollars coming in here. And the time when it comes for me to pay in dollars, I have the dollars. Even with the growing fears, government will not back down on borrowing, but plans to do so cautiously and selectively especially for infrastructure development with intention to grow the economy and boost domestic revenue. Michael Baleke, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Over in Somalia, a ban on the use of local currency in several regions of the country has had a negative effect on enterprises. The country has now has no new currency in place and traders have been forced to use the American dollar. Now, For many SMEs, that does impose some pretty steep costs, as CGTN's Abdulaziz Billow now reports. This is the biggest market in Beledwene, a strategic town in central Somalia on the border with neighboring Ethiopia. Mobile money is dominant here after the business community banned the use of the local currency that has had a troubling effect on small business owners in most towns in central Somalia. Traders say the current banknotes in circulation is mostly fake, torn and in a poor state. Fadum Abshir is a tea vendor in Beledwene and says the lack of local currency has affected her business. We prefer transacting using the Somali shilling as compared to mobile money services. Because we get our money in cash, clients send the money to a wrong number, others never send it. We have a big problem dealing with mobile money payment. Farmers too have also been affected by the ban. Farm produce harvested in this region is mostly ferried to Puntland and other central Somali towns that have also abandoned the use of cash payments. We have a big problem with the absence of the Somali shilling. Every transaction is done using the dollar. This has affected our business and we are appealing to authorities to bring the shilling back. The only banknotes available in the country is the thousand shilling, after smaller denominations stopped circulating almost three decades ago. Authorities have condemned the ban on the Somali currency by the business community, but are not providing any quick solutions. Finance Minister has announced Mogadishu's plans to print new currency, displaying the sample to both local and international media. Printing money for a country that has no money 
is a major task. It's a major undertaking. And alone, we could not have done it. We could not dream doing it ourselves. Now we are looking for the cost of printing money, which is not a small amount, $40 million. Just to print your money, $40 million. And that, uh, we, are, we are close to getting it, securing through the, through the IMF. And, and we thank them very much all the time and the international community. Uh, we are thinking that uh, very soon uh, there will be currency circulated in this country that are shilling. Somalia has one of the most active mobile money markets in the world, with telecommunication companies commanding millions of subscribers. The new currency will allow Mogadishu to challenge telecom companies and exact overall authority in the country's economy that has in the past years begun to record major improvements. Abdul Aziz Bilal, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. British lawmakers have started five days of debate ahead of a delayed vote on Prime Minister Theresa May's heavily criticised Brexit deal. Now that debate starts just a day after lawmakers gave the Prime Minister a staying defeat. Uh, it's aimed essentially at preventing the UK from leaving the EU with no agreement in place. This vote came as lawmakers approved a measure that would essentially curtail the government's ability to levy taxes in case of a no-deal Brexit. Lawmakers will vote on the divorce agreement on the 15th of January. That's next week, Tuesday. The deal is, forcing, is facing rather quite a bit of opposition as the clock ticks down to the UK's departure from the EU on the 29th of March at 2300 GMT. The world's largest tech show, CES, is underway in Las Vegas. The annual event is giving Chinese firms a platform to showcase their new tech to a global audience in the world's largest economy. CGTN's Mark New filed this report about the latest the greatest and the quirky. I'm here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. This is the famous show floor where more than 4,400 companies from around the world are exhibiting their products. 13 to 14% of the footprint here, Chinese companies. One of those making waves is the company Royal, which actually in October made waves by releasing the world's first flexible phone. It actually has one, two, and three screens. As crowds marvel at the FlexPi for the first time, the company is showing off its bendable screens in phones, apparel, and much more. Tell me what's new here. Yes, so what we're seeing here is a flexible keyboard that's literally you know, a full-size keyboard that is made on top of a cine film, and you can actually just retract it with an electronic mo motor, and you can... It's really thin, huh? How thin? Yes is under 50 micron. Um, so that's very, very thin. As you can see here, I'm typing. So CES, that's it. At CES, other Chinese startups are proving that AI can be embedded in practically anything with wheels. For example, the startup Ford X from Beijing has produced this Ovis smart suitcase. All I have to do is hold it for three seconds. The camera uses computer vision to recognize me in artificial intelligence can follow me wherever I go. Try to shake it. Still knows where I am. Oh look, his suitcase is following him. In addition to the self-following suitcase, Forward X also has a service robot and a lawnmower robot all driven by AI. We bring the AI brain. I mean the perception, the algorithm and the controlling together. It, it can enable different real robots to see the world, understand the space, understand the people. Chinese company iFlyTech is making a splash at CES by using AI to help machines and devices learn, listen and translate. And I'm here with Dr. Li Tran Gong who is the Vice President of iFlyTech. This is the iFlyTech Translator 2.0. I'm going to ask him some questions. This uses artificial intelligence offline to translate. What have you been doing so far? Uh, 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 I am attending the American Consumer Electronics Show. Do you think this device will revolutionize communication? Artificial intelligence, of course, is changing the world. Just a few of the Chinese tech companies here at the Consumer Electronics Show, transforming the way we communicate and work on the go. I'll be here all week for more coverage at CES. Mark New, CGTN, Las Vegas.
All right, then I'll leave you there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though. We'll be looking at why the United Nations is saying that Nigeria lost nearly $3 billion worth of revenues in 2018 just from the theft of oil. All that and more is coming your way at 1800 GMT on Global Business Africa. See you then. For now, though, back to Karen. Thank you very much, Rama. Well, we are going to a short break. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... Suffering in silence, how one Nigerian woman is helping her country talk about its mental health. Join us from Global Business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. <sighs> so let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. In Nigeria, we meet a woman who is leading the fight against stigma associated with mental health. Hawa Oje Ifo was diagnosed with bipolar and post-traumatic stress in 2015. She's not allowed it to bring her down. Instead, she's using her experience to raise awareness on mental illness in a country where 30% of the population is affected. Here's Alexandria Magella with more. In a country where the government says 30% of the population suffer from some form of mental illness and that the national suicide rate is on the rise, there's still considerable stigma around mental health. Hawa Ojiye 4 wants to change that. In 2015, she was diagnosed as bipolar and suffering from post-traumatic stress after being sexually assaulted several years earlier. A friend of hers in the UK suggests that she finds a support group. And I looked around and I didn't find any. And I'm like, you know what then? And she's like, you know what, just start it, really. And that was just what I did. I didn't overthink it. Her group has grown into an initiative called She Writes Woman, which uses a helpline blog posts and social media to reach people. But the taboo around mental health means OJ4 and other mental health advocates face a tough job. In Nigeria, um, I don't think they really do seek for help. Some just die in silence and some think they can maybe pray on the old issue and get fine. OJ4 says her helpline receives a minimum of 100 calls a day. She has leveraged the success of She Writes Woman to start a walk-in clinic where people can receive treatment as well as information. Operating in a country that holds Africa's largest population, this might appear like a small initiative. However, the initiative's success is just but a window to a bigger conversation on mental health in Nigeria. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. Well, we've got all the sport coming up for you after the break, including... Mohamed Salah's return to the pinnacle of African football. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point only on CGTN. We begin with football. South African female player Tembe Kafana beat season names to be named the best player for 2018 at the African Football Awards ceremony. And as CGTN Sadiq Shaban reports, it was another night to remember for Egypt's Mohamed Salah. 
Egypt Mohamed Salah has been voted the African Male Player of the Year for the second year running, beating Gabon's Emerick Aboumeyang and Senegal's Sadio Mane. Honestly, I'm very happy to win it for the second time. And, you know, I said before, even I said in the speech there, like, when I was young, I always had a dream to win this award, and now I won it twice, so I'm happy about that. But really, I would love to win the African nation in Egypt, especially when you play in home and with your people, and everyone is very excited, so we will do our best to, to win it in Egypt. In the Women's Player of the Year category, South Africa's Tembi Katlana walked away with the title. I'm just overwhelmed with everything. I never expected that I'd be at a 22 years old, I'd be here in the Cup Awards, scooping uh, African Player of the Year and getting a best goal of 2018. Mauritania was voted the male team of the year, while Nigeria was declared the best team of the year after winning the Women's Cup of Nations. Morocco's coach, Javier René, was named the coach of the year, while South Africa's Desiree Ellis won her first major African title, having been named the women's coach of the year. I'm uh, very lucky, thanks to my federation, my president of federation, and uh, of course my staff. Without them, uh, you can't win anything. And of course my players, because they did very well in 2018, and uh, if I receive this uh, award, it's because of them. The Football Awards congregation marks the end of business for 2018 in African football and officially ushers in the 2019 season. Sadiq Shaban, CGTN, in Dakar, Senegal. The 1500 meters race is one of Algeria's favorite events in athletics. The North African country has won four gold and two silver medals at the Olympics over the years. CGTN's Edmund Niapola caught up with one of the gold medalists and now reports from Algiers. Nuria Benidamera takes a walk down memory lane to her corner at the Algerian Olympics Committee Museum in Algiers. For the umpteenth time, she looks at the memorabilia from her Olympic gold medal winning run more than 18 years ago in Sydney, Australia. Against all odds, little fancied Nuria upstaged her competitors to win the coveted prize. And just like that, Algeria had won only her second women's 1500 meters gold at the Olympics. She remembers that fateful day like it was yesterday. My biggest memory of my gold medal was my spirit. I came into it with the fourth best time, and despite that, I still managed to win gold. Before I left for Sydney, I told myself that Algeria is here. I am Algerian, and I represent a big country. I went all in and I told myself, I am going to win. So I won. It wasn't easy for me but I won and honored my country in the Olympic Games. The thing I'll never forget is that I dedicated my medal to the Algerian people and Arab women. She followed in the footsteps of Hasiba Bulmerka, Algeria's first ever Olympic gold medalist, who took the top prize at the Barcelona 1992 Olympic Games in the women's 1500 meters. Nuria honored Algerian women with the medal. It came at a time when playing sport for Arab women was met with resistance. I am Arab and I am Algerian. It's true that my country was going through a rough patch, but that didn't stop me from training. I trained and prepared in Algeria and I'm proud because my medal is 100% Algerian. I won gold and the Algerian woman was represented in the Olympic Games. Our women have two gold medals, myself and my friend Hasiba Bulmerka. We are still standing. They stand tall as the pace set us to what would become one of Algeria's favorite Olympic disciplines, the 1,500 meters. From Bulmerka, Nuria, Noreddin Museli to today's Taufik Maklufi, the North African country boasts four gold medals and two silver medals in the middle distance event. This was Algeria's first medal at London 2012. You could say it's an Algerian tradition. It's a specialty that we love and that we have a lot of success in. I know why I had success. One time I saw a foot doctor thinking I had flat feet. 
I wanted to ask him for inserts for my shoes. He said, who told you you have flat feet? You don't have flat feet. You have performance feet. You will see, you will have great performances. A year later, I set a record and won gold at the Olympic Games. For Nuria, her greatest wish is to see more space at the Olympic Museum taken up by winners of her favorite track event. Edmond Nyabola, CGTN, Algiers, Algeria.